Now, what is the group of patients that I, in my clinical practice, obviously if we can enroll them into the PREVENT study, that's what we're doing at this time to, to see if uh, anti-TNF strategies make sense. But the group of patients that I would consider for post-op anti-TNF are those that present with perforating, penetrating disease or have had several surgeries in the past and are now coming to another surgery. That's possibly the group that I would consider in practice. Certainly, this is the group that the PREVENT study is looking to enroll uh, in its strategy, this highest risk group of patients. Uh, so, so I think from a clinical standpoint, um, whether we should be doing this in everybody, uh, I'm not necessarily saying that that's, uh, that's prime time yet, but that is the group of patients that I'm looking at in my practice. Um, so this is just a reiteration of the highest risk patients. I will also put on this the third bullet point. Those patients who I've had on weight-based dose of azathioprine 6-MP, even higher than weight-based dose that I rarely will check metabolites, and I know they're in what they should be the therapeutic range, and they've had progression of disease despite that, maybe that's a group of patients that either we use methotrexate, which about a third of our patients are on now methotrexate rather than the other immunosuppressive medicines, or maybe that's a group of patients that we should at least combine with an anti-TNF. And, and again, uh, stay tuned for that, uh, for that to come. Well, why not delay biologics? So this is a question that comes up quite a bit. Should we prevent recurrence in all of these patients, or should we wait to treat the patients based on recurrence? Um, and I'll just, uh, I, I, I think I'll wrap it up with some of these data, and then we can open it up for discussion. So why not wait for a clinical recurrence? And I mentioned already at the beginning, Paul Ruckgertz had shown this years ago, but in our study, one of the interesting and, and somewhat frightening from a clinical standpoint aspects is if you look at the remission from an endoscopic, zero and one, and you look down that the column, and then right next to it, you look at the recurrence, two, three, or four. Our Crohn's disease activity scores, the median Crohn's disease activity score, was no different between the two groups. And now I can also tell you that in my clinical practice, I have patients at six months who I'm doing colonoscopy, and they have a score of three, but they tell me this is the best that they've ever felt. So I, I think the days of following clinical recurrence and symptoms after surgery are gone. I, I would argue possibly for all IBD, these clinical scores are, are problematic. What about delaying until you have an endoscopic recurrence? Uh, there has been one study looking at this, and I'll uh, present some of the data here. This may be reasonable. It may be reasonable to do an early colonoscopy, or possibly if uh, Peter shows us the way, maybe doing ultrasounds to see early changes, and based on those data, start treatment, or if there is no evidence of recurrence, leave that patient alone. Um, what's possibly some of the limitations? I realize this is a busy slide, but the top two are the post-operative data. The bottom are all of the medical data. And just to walk you through this briefly, the top two are the Yamamoto study and then some of our data looking at uh, the patients who went into the placebo arm and had a recurrence. And if you just focus on the top two for now, um, the Yamamoto study, just to recap that, is patients underwent surgery, they did not go on an anti-TNF unless at six months on a colonoscopy they had endoscopic recurrence. So they didn't treat them until they saw a recurrence. Interestingly, when you look at the endoscopic remission rates, so patients who had recurrence then went on anti-TNF, their remission rate was 38%. So it wasn't as robust as we see from a prevention strategy. We actually found in our study the patients on placebo who had recurrence at a year then went on treatment, about two-thirds of those patients had a remission. So the question is that should that be the strategy we use, we're still not able to heal the mucosa in a large percentage of those patients. Well, what about our medical treatment studies? You're all familiar with these. These are Sonic, Accent 1, uh, Music, and Extend study. When you look at complete mucosal healing, no ulcers, no inflammation, is, which is what we looked at from a prevention postoperatively, our rates of complete mucosal healing are maybe a third at best. Why is that? And Peter and I were talking a little bit about this yesterday. Dave Binion's a vascular biologist who's interested in looking at this in our group. 
We think that once you start to develop inflammation and ulcers, there may be some mechanistic changes, whether it has to do with the extracellular matrix, whether it has to do with the vasculature itself, or some inflammatory process, that some of these patients, if in, in simple terms, become too far gone to recover the inflammation. So why in our clinical treatment trials, when Tim enrolls a patient with moderate to severe Crohn's in one of these biologics, and they feel pretty well, but we look and only about a third of them heal completely, it may be that enough damage has been done that it's impossible for us to recover. So if we put that in the context of mucosal healing, at least from the post-op prevention studies, we actually see very high rates of prevention of inflammation. The question is, if we do early scopes after a, a resection, we see pretty good results, but not as high. And I think our medical patients that we see who've had years of disease, we're not seeing these high rates of improvement, probably because there's some other damage on a, on a microvascular level uh, that's probably occurring that's impossible for us to recover. So just in summary, uh, I would say from a practical standpoint, the lowest risk patients I would not necessarily put on any treatment. Now, these are fairly rare for us to see, and I imagine you probably aren't seeing these patients as well. Uh, that middle group, I think azathioprine, 6-MP, and if they can tolerate the an antibiotic, and if Hans shows us that Cipro works well, maybe a combination of an antibiotic with an immunomodulator would be reasonable. <clears throat> I think for the highest risk group patients, these would be the ones to consider. Certainly enroll them in the PREVENT study, I, I think makes uh, perfect sense. And where are we going? I'll just tell you that at our group now, and we met about this last week, um, we're actually, we have uh, some people interested in the microbiome. Rick Doerr is a geneticist that I work with who spent a career looking at this. Um, and then we actually have some neurophysiologists and vascular biologists. Now we're looking at the post-operative model to see if we can actually figure out why there's recurrence and possibly if we look at it from a post-op standpoint, we could possibly uh, extrapolate this to all Crohn's disease. Clearly there are environmental and uh, bacterial processes uh, at hand. Um, and then you're familiar with the uh, PREVENT study that's well underway. Um, uh, I've had the honor of being the North American uh, PI. Paul Rutgers is the European PI. Uh, I know your group is already up and running, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll all be able to enroll more patients and really understand if this makes sense or not. Maybe the study won't show the results that we saw in our small pilot. So this is my IBD group back in Pittsburgh, which I acknowledge and thank for allowing me to come and talk to you all today. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions.